A carpal tunnel syndrome occurs when there is sufficient pressure on the median nerve as it goes through the carpal tunnel itself to cause an electrical dysfunction of the nerve. And the patient will present with symptoms numbness, pins and needles in the radiation of that nerve. The carpal tunnel itself is made up of a valley of the carpal bones and effectively across the top of the valley is the flexor retinaculum and that gives us a tunnel. And through that, the only structures that are there are the flexor tendons to the fingers and the thumb and the median nerve. And what classically happens is you might get some swelling or synovitis of the flexor tendons causing the secondary pressure on the median nerve and that then causes the patient's symptoms. I think the main differential diagnosis is essentially another source and in most of the patients who will present to all of us with carpal tunnel type symptoms they're going to be older patients who also possibly have degenerative disc disease in their cervical spine. In those patients you can really try and sieve them out I guess by looking at whether they have any symptoms or signs in their cervical spine itself, pain or stiffness on clinical examination. That's the first major batch of patients taken care of. The second group would be patients with peripheral neuropathy. And peripheral neuropathy can be a, a, as a secondary event of a number of different uh, causes. But in general, those patients do have more diffuse patterns of symptoms. And they don't have the nice, clean uh, symptoms in the radial three and a half digits of their hand. In other words, the median nerve distribution. So for me, if they have symptoms involving their little finger as well as the rest of their hand, I'm looking for another source of symptoms rather than the carpal tunnel itself. When a patient presents with pretty typical uh, symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome, again, a radial uh, three and a half digits, symptoms, numbness, pins and needles, tingling, Classically, symptoms of nighttime, uh, they wake up, they have to shake their hand around, elevated use of their hands, reading a newspaper, holding onto a steering wheel. These are all the good symptoms that match carpal tunnel syndrome, but you do have to follow on with a clinical examination. And for me, the, the main findings of clinical examination are initially, firstly, provocation tests, trying to irritate the median nerve. First test would be a Tunnell's nerve percussion test. Tunnell's nerve percussion test is a simple percussion test that you can perform on any superficial nerve. And it's simply performed by, firstly, knowing the anatomy of the median nerve. And in this case, it comes pretty much down the middle of the forearm and goes into the wrist underneath the flexor retinaculum itself, after which it breaks into the motor and sensory branches onto the radial three and a half digits. And I start a little bit sh um, short or proximal to the flexor crease and tap along the nerve right into the palm. Second test I use is carpal tunnel compression test. And in this case, again, anatomy is useful. So pressing, and you can see that I'm pressing sufficient to take away some of the blood from my nail bed over the median nerve just before the flexor retinaculum and I'm holding that for about 30 seconds or so. And I also perform this over the flexor retinaculum itself. So both tests sometimes are useful, particularly if the patient has a very thickened uh, skin, a big laboring type hand, where pressure over that palm itself may not really work simply due to the thickness of the soft tissue structures. And the last test is Phelan's test, holding the wrist in a flexed position and letting the patient hold their hand for about, again, 20 to 30 seconds to see if this brings on their symptoms. There are a number of conditions uh, which can exacerbate a patient with possibly mild carpal tunnel syndrome and breaking them into two groups, reversible conditions, pregnancy, hyperglycemia, hypothyroidism, inflammatory tendinopathies or arthropathies. And in all of those conditions, treatment of the condition or for most women, the completion of the pregnancy will resolve the carpal tunnel syndrome. The other condition is degenerative disc disease. And in these older group of patients, we're often faced with the problem of having a patient with pathology at both sites. And actually, mild nerve compression at the neck combined with at the wrist itself can exacerbate the symptoms significantly.
and we call this a double crush syndrome. So a mild crush in two places along the same nerve track. And essentially it's a lot easier to decompress the nerve at the wrist. And sometimes even though we don't treat the neck, this can resolve their symptoms completely in their arm and help their neck symptoms as well. I think when a patient presents with symptoms in keeping with carpal tunnel syndrome, I think the first port of call is the symptoms and signs. If their symptoms are anatomical, match what we'd expect, if, if they are positive clinical signs, particularly carpal tunnel compression test and the Tunnels test, then I think you, it is really carpal tunnel syndrome. And I think it's reasonable then to find, you know, make your diagnosis at that stage and commence your treatment. If the symptoms and signs don't match up, I then think you need to consider other investigations. And for me, the treatment, the, sorry, the investigation of choice will be EMG studies, because these will tell you whether there is an electrical dysfunction of the nerve as it goes through the carpal tunnel. It'll also give you information about whether the patient has a peripheral neuropathy, and it'll also give, a patient, uh, give you some information about whether there's a cervical radiculopathy. So the EMG test is probably our neatest test to do. The good news is that a big bunch of patients who, who develop carpal tunnel syndrome will resolve spontaneously. We've already talked about women with pregnancy and uh, usually after the completion of pregnancy it does settle. Sometimes in fact it flares up after the uh, end of pregnancy and patients need treatment at that stage. So about 40% of patients will resolve with mild or conservative treatment. These patients are generally in the younger age group, male as well as female, and generally a period of maybe mod uh, modifying their activities, uh, cooling them down if they're doing a lot of stuff in the gym or at work, will be sufficient to let it all settle down. For the other patients, the natural history is of gradual slow progression, where their symptoms may not necessarily get worse, but they persist. And in those patients, one should be concerned about the risk of permanent damage to the median nerve, permanent restriction of electrical function, even with a carpal tunnel release. And these are sort of the elderly patients that some of us would see with wasting in their abductor pollicis brevis muscle. And once you get wasting, you get permanent damage of the nerve. I think the non-surgical management is really important because a lot of patients will resolve with uh, conservative or medical treatment. Certainly if there's a, a primary cause for carpal tunnel syndrome, be it endocrine or whatever, resolving that issue or controlling it will generally improve the situation significantly for them. Treatments using wrist splints are really important for again settling down the any inflammatory or uh, synovitis inside the uh, carpal tunnel itself. So using a wrist splint at night time can be very successful in settling down these patients with milder symptoms. Treatments with diuretics, oral corticosteroids, really do not have much support in the literature. And I would suggest that these sort of treatments, uh, such as again vitamin B uh, complex, probably doesn't really have much benefit at all. But overall conservative management will work well in that younger cohort of patients in particular and I certainly think should be tried for a period of time before consideration is given towards referral onto a specialist. The surgical management of carpal tunnel syndrome is essentially a decompression of the carpal tunnel and therefore taking pressure off the median nerve itself. So if we imagine our valley of carpal bones with the flexor retinaculum across the top, by dividing that longitudinally, it takes the pressure off the nerve. And this will then heal up over a period of time, but in that more relaxed position. It's, that's stage one of the recovery, taking pressure off the nerve. The nerve then has to naturally recover and not all do. So some patients, a small number, probably less than 5%, continue to have significant persistent symptoms of pain and numbness. And this is as a result of damage inside the nerve itself. And unfortunately, we don't have an answer for patients with that type of permanent problem inside the nerve. The surgery itself is a decompression of the carpal tunnel, thereby taking pressure off the nerve, allowing it to function normally.
The surgery can be undertaken by an open technique, which is a two centimeter incision over the volar aspect of the flexor retinaculum at the base of the palm. The endoscopic technique can be made using smaller incisions either in the distal forearm or in the palm itself. Both uh, techniques have their good bits and their bad bits, but essentially the results of both operations are very good.